Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie LeBlanc, and I serve as the head of executive engagement in the office of the CDO here at Google. I am, I've been trying to think, thrilled, excited, honored, humbled uh, to be here for this year's Black History Month Fireside Chat with the one and only Kiki Palmer. Let me get you on the screen. Hi. Hello. So, <laughs> you know, as we do things, right, I have to read your bio. But before I do, I actually wrote something for you. It's called an oriki. Have you ever heard or familiar with the term? No. Okay, so listen. So an oriki is a Yoruba word, and it means praise your, your head or your mind. And essentially, it's like a greeting that praises like your kinship, your history, and speaks life to your destiny. So think of it like as a, a, a hype mantra. And so I learned this from um, Lovey Ajayi Jones, if you've heard of her amazing woman and author. And so I wanted to create a short one for you that just touches on the greatness and impact uh, that your life has had on us. Are you ready? Yes, thank okay. you so much. Okay, so Lauren Kiana of House Palmer, first of her name, muse of the millennials, commander of her craft, Melanin Magnificence, teller of truths, creator of paths for our community, builder of black excellence, consummate entertainer, keeper of the bag, oh. and most importantly, knower of the gags. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I love that. Absolutely love it. And I, I'm not being biased just because you're talking about me, but I thought the wordplay was given, Stephanie. <laughs> you nailed it. All right, great. And so now I'm going to translate that into formal speak so that we are speaking to our entire audience. So Kiki is an uh, Emmy award winning actress, singer, songwriter, host, producer, author, entrepreneur and passionate voice of the millennial generation. Kiki has starred in over 25 films and 30 TV shows and counting. Most recently, she's launched her own digital network, Key TV, which you can check out the YouTube channel, uh, and is dedicated to spotlighting a new generation of diverse creators and democratizing the entertainment industry, and has a podcast called Baby is Kiki Palmer. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here and for everyone watching, glad that they joined us. I'm looking forward to this great conversation. So glad, glad to be here. Awesome. So now I had told you backstage that the level of excitement by our community to have you here today was already at an all time high. <laughs> and then last night you dropped on Instagram that you and your partner welcomed your baby. So first, I want to extend a huge congratulations to you Thank both you. Uh, on the birth of your beautiful baby boy. Thank you. I'm, I'm honestly, this is the, you know, all the all the different jobs, you know, you talked about me having. I um, this is the, the one I'm most proud of. You know, I'm just so excited and thankful to be a mother and to have my son in my life. And I'm just it's a whole new chapter of yeah. my um, world. And so I, I just I so appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. And so, as we also said, we had lots of folks being like, she coming, she not coming, she needs to stay <laughs> home, she should be here, all the things. And so to bring everyone up to speed, in the last, call it 72 hours, you have won an NAACP award, given birth, and you're, you're here with us today. And so part of the discourse that has happened are in the many camps that I kind of just shared, like, Look at you, you're sitting there, you look good, you're, you're glowing, you're moisturized, like baby wear. Um, and then there's another camp that's like, yep, that's what women do. That's what black women do, right? We do what we gotta do and we do what we choose to do yeah. even when we have a baby or our children in tow. And so I think you being here today um, is definitely a model for that. And so I'd love for you to just give life to your parenting philosophy, even just a few hours in, on how you expect or plan to integrate uh, motherhood into the lifestyle and the career that, that you've built? Oh, yeah. I don't know if I have the answers to that really just yet, but I know um, more than anything that 
you know, I take it seriously. I mean, I think I had really good parents growing up. I think they dedicated their lives to me. Um, even when you think about my career and how I got started, you know, you know, uh, my parents were into theater and in performing arts growing up, but they left that all behind, you know, once they started having kids. And when they had me and they saw that same passion in me, it took mm -hmm. nothing for them to uproot their lives in Illinois and drive four days and three nights to California to help me pursue my dreams. So I think that alone for me means that my kid will come first. But I think also that means that I want to show my kids amazing things, right? I want to show them what discipline is. I want to show my son what it means to actually, you know, say you're going to start something and finish it and how to run a business. And so I think it's, it's going to be a difficult balance because I want to be super mom and I want to do all this stuff. But I also want to make sure that my child, uh, you know, knows that they come first. So it's a journey I'm looking forward to figuring out. But um, I think I had really good examples of, of how to do it. And the examples is something that I want for us to touch on. So this year's theme for Black History Month here at Google is it takes a village, right? Oh. And so throughout the month, we've been, you know, taking time to explore the power of community, celebrating the people and places that have shaped our respective journeys, and how we each then play a role in elevating under others. And so I wonder, like you talked about your parents, but just uh, holistically, who are some of the members of your village and how have they shaped both your personal and professional journey? Oh, that's so good because, you know, sometimes it does all bleed in together, you know, um, yep. and I think that that does happen with me because I, 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 my brand and what I do, essentially, it is a family business. You know what I mean? Um, my, my family always has been hands on in helping me to get where I am today. And so I, I think my village is obviously my the immediate family I grew up in, you know, which is my mother, my father and my three other siblings, um, you know, and then I think now it's become my partner, my son and my best friend who I also do business with, um, you know, and, and a few others like, you know, the village is continuously growing. But um, yeah, you know, I think for me, I always say you can never do anything alone. And when people's looking at me, oh, Kiki, you doing this, Kiki, you doing that? Just know I got a whole crew behind me. Um, and so I'm a strong believer that, yeah, it does take a village. You know, you never want to be the only person there. And if somebody is the only person standing there doing that, that ain't nobody that knows how to play, you know, in a team. So you don't want to be bothered with them no way. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'm sure there's a village with you today as there yes. is every day. Right. Um, and so that also makes me think of this phrase that we are standing on the shoulder of giants. Right. That your parents being those giants, your grandparents, your family, your friends. Um, but in the same breath, we are also the giants, especially with you, right? Like your body of work in the 20 plus years of your career has allowed those um, to stand on your shoulders and achieve things that wouldn't have been possible without your presence. So like take a moment and sit in that, that you are the giants that we talk of present day. Um, but also talk to me about how the giants in your life have shaped how you show up, uh, make pathways for and invest in others. Okay. So I love to invest in others. I think the way that the giants showed up in my life, you know, and, and obviously I'm sure it goes beyond my, just my father, um, and the way that my father was raised. But when I just think about my dad, he's always been about community and being of service um, and using whatever tools and skills you have to be in service of others. So even if it is something like entertainment, which doesn't necessarily seem like an of service job right off the bat, um, it does come with a platform. And that platform is where you can be of service and you can shine a light on things that are important to you, specifically your community. And I think growing up, obviously, Black, you know, in America, um, there's a lot of history there that can make you feel, you know, okay, wait a minute, what am I up against here? But my family always just encouraged me and, ma and made me feel just so proud of my history and introduced me to people like Muhammad Ali, you know what I mean? Um, you know, uh, Ruby D, Ozzie Davis told me the stories of the people that came before me in my position and what they did with it. Um, and so that knowledge, I think, gave me a clear pathway of who I wanted to be, you know, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and what the message I wanted uh, to, behind, to be behind what I did, the kind of legacy I wanted to build and how I just wanted to show up. Um, so those giants, I think they definitely built 
you know, my, my, my father, my mother, you know, and the people that inspired them, uh, ones they know and ones they didn't know, definitely when it came to community and being of service and representing and, and um, taking what you can back to your village, they made that clear in whatever avenue, whether I was going to be, a, you know, singer or entertainer, or even if I was probably going to be a hairstylist, they were like, you know, take it back and, and know that it's about more than just you. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the main thing that I think about when I think about like standing on the shoulder of, of giants is that it was always trying to make it easier, make it better, give another opportunity to the next. And now that you're the giant and becoming even more, um, e expanding your reach even more, right? You have Key TV now, which is a digital platform. Um, talk to me about your decision, your decisioning around developing your own platform. We out know the need for having more representation in, in the creators, but what was that connection of like knowing you, knowing about a thing, having the passion and the skill set for a thing, but then actually executing on the thing? Well, the executing is continuous. You know, the, <laughs> as you all know, you know, executing is like, it's a forever journey. Um, and this mm -hmm. is a different position for me, right, than usual. I'm now moving into starting in, in a, a whole um, you know, a whole different brand, essentially, uh, an extension of my brand, but, but it's still its own thing, you know, and it, it's from the ground up, you know, and, um, so that, that part, I try to give myself grace on or in grace with, mm, but I think, um, right. You got to, but I think that the initial reason why I wanted to do it, it really is like what we were just talking about uh, in the conversation of service. I think I've, I've been in this industry for 20 years. I started when I was nine. Um, and, it reached a point for me, especially, you know, after I did the movie with Jordan Peele, Nope, and, and just that experience and how working with him it impacted me. I kind of felt like, okay, you know, I've, I've experienced a lot in this industry and I know I will cont continue to. I mean, I've seen it go up, around and sideways and forwards. And I know it's going to be more of the same, the different mm -hmm. stages of my career. And I'm cool with that. And I, I love that. It's, it's awesome as it pertains to me, myself. But then I think about well, what else is it outside of that? Because it has to be more. I think that's just kind of how I was raised to think and look at things is that, well, what else can it give? You know, because if I've achieved this and I've accomplished this and I feel content with this in myself, how can I add on to that and make it not just me? Um, because it gets to a point where you look around and say, well, I've got to I've got to multiply this. Um, and that's I think that's something that had been sticking with me for some time. And I never could figure out or, or the vision hadn't come to me of how I could trans transport what I've been able to create with the Kiki Palmer brand into something that doesn't just, it isn't just about Kiki, but it's mm -hmm. about the culture. It's about the community. It's about um, the diversity that we know is there, but doesn't always get the platform. It's about bringing those eyes to, you know, these kids that are out there on, you know, you know, uh, millennial, the millennial Kings and Queens of today, the Gen Zers, yeah. the ones that are out there creating content constantly and just, don't always have that platform to get the eyes to see them or get the opportunities um, that I know I've been blessed to, to receive in my career. And so that's what made me want to start Key TV um, and, and really be able to not only shine a light on new creatives that want to be in front of the camera, but also the people that are behind the scenes. I kind of really wanted my audience to get a chance to see and understand uh, the skill set that it takes to be in the entertainment industry, you know, mm -hmm. what it means to be an owner, you know, when, when I talk to my creators and the people that I'm working with on Key TV, you know, it's a part, it's a true partnership. So bringing that conversation to the forefront with those creators, um, you know, having those real conversations and making sure that, Hey, we're equal here. You know what I mean? Um, as well as showing the audience what it means to be a grip, what it means to be a DP, what it means to be, a uh, sound designer, you know, these are all positions that you can that you can also be in. It's not just about having to be a performer. So really just, again, diversifying, but also democratizing what it means to be in the entertainment industry, uh -huh. because this is an industry that really changed my life. And I think so many other people could benefit from that if they just had access to it. You know, yeah, I think access to it and also just knowing holistically what that world looks like. Cause you know, not everyone is going to be Kiki Palmer. Not everyone is going to be the number one, number two box office, but if you can have a hand in it, I yes. think of um, Women King and how the whole, oh. whole production from like start to finish, there are so many opportunities and spaces to touch magnificent work. 
Um, but all we know is like the actor and the actress, that's who we see on the red carpet. So that's who we want to be. And so I love that, that key TV is, is bringing that and bringing that knowledge access, the knowledge access. Well, because that's really the key is what I, you know, again, keys to the culture, key Mm -hmm. TV. The key is, especially when it pertains to our community, you know, it's, a lot of times we don't get we, we haven't had the access or the resources to know how it, how to get from point A to point B. And that's yeah. that's the thing. You know, when they say knowledge is power, that's what it means, because otherwise you you then will say, well, it's because I'm this or it's because I'm that or, you know, this will never happen for me or I'm always going to be so and so. And you okay. tell yourself a story that's not true. And really, it's just information. You need the information, because if I were to tell you that the reason why so and so is on TV is because they got a publicist and you'd be like. But what's the publicist? Right. You know, or the reason why so and so was hooked up to that job was because they had an agent that also knew that producer. Well, what? what how does is that how the industry works? You mm-hmm. know, there's so much there's so much nuance that goes into any industry, whether it's tech, entertainment, politics, etc. You know, when it's all politics, really, at the end of the day. But that's yeah. another story. <laughs> another day. Say that it's information, and that's if that's to me the greatest thing that we can give to one another is information. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's as simple as, hey, this is where I got my hair done. Go get hooked up. You know, this is what, this is this is how you get it done. You know what I mean? And then the rest is, yeah, your skills got to be on point too. So let's talk about the skills because information is important. Uh, the skills, the, the creative process, the belief and confidence in your creativity. Yes. And I know a lot of folks out there, especially us in the in the tech space, we're like, oh, well, you know, we're more analytical like that. That's sure. like a stereotype of, of this space. But there is just this burgeoning creativity that's inside of us. We're like, oh, that's not my lane. I'm here. So I can't do that. I'd love to, mm-hmm. for you to talk about your creative process, but also the confidence in your creativity that allows you to be like, I'm going to go out and do it. Yeah, I mean, it really comes from, you know, just me saying, why not? You know, I mean, I think if you if you're coming from a genuine place with something and this is I truly stand by this and it sounds simple, but I really think it's it's the difference between something happening for you and something not is what are you doing it for? When I have an idea or I I decide to be creative, I really ask myself, what do I want out of this? You know, what is truly the end game goal? You know what I mean? And if it's at any point, or oh, I want people to like me, or I want people to think I'm cool, or I want something. If it's anything that's you know trying to get secret, out of the- right? I know that's not a real that that's fake. That's not real. Mm-hmm. Now, if I say, well, I just you know I feel like this can be this, and this is so cool, and this is so that, and it's coming out of me, then I know it's genuine. I know it's true, and now I can trust myself. Now we can go to stage two because now I know that the idea and the reason why I'm doing this is rooted in something pure. Now the mm-hmm. next stage it's about assembly. That's about you know. Who can I have working with me? You know, it's so interesting. You say, you know, how tech people can feel creatively. Well, creative people can feel the same way when it comes to tech. You know, we, we all try to, you know, hop into different spaces. And that's why you work with, with multiple people. That's why you you collaborate. I think collaboration is huge. And to me, it's been a great tool that I've used throughout my careers. I collaborate. Teach me. Show me. I want to learn. I want to be a student. Hey, and hey, if I can't figure it out, then I want you on my team. So then I assemble who I'm going to have help me work through this creative process and how I'm going to actually get to the point where I can actually actualize this. And then that final or that, or that third, because I think the steps can continue, but if I were to give top three, that third stage is being persistent and consistent. Okay. And that's the hardest part. Yes. Okay, I put it in these terms. <laughs> it's like continuing to post that same thing or those that, that series and it's only got 200 views, you know, but continuing it anyway. Yeah. That is when the stuff that's is- the mountain that stops Woo! people. And I'm telling you, you feel like it's never going to happen. But if you pass level one and you pass level two, level three, while it might be difficult, it's going to take you to a whole nother ball game. And now you done beat up Bowser, you know what I'm saying? And you and the princess is off to Super Mario Kart. Right. <laughs> a Nintendo reference for anybody. <laughs> well, old school reference. Well, old school yeah, I know reference. about it. I know about it. <laughs> But you know, you you at that point you're onto another book. But those yeah. are the first three chapters. Uh, those are the first. That's the chap. Those are the chapters of the first book to me. Yeah. Once you once you you know realize that uh, 
everything's you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, you know, that old cliche is mm -hmm. true because I've seen it and I've seen it time and time again throughout my career. And that's always, um, you know, that's always my advice. I love that advice. And I'm going to rewatch this so I can write down the, the three steps. Assembly is the one that really stuck out to me. I think I find, I'll speak on behalf of the audience. I'm not talking about me, but <laughs> they, they sometimes are in their head, right? In our head being like, oh, can I, should I do these people want this particular thing? And, you know, again, in the age of, of social media, how things can get dragged, canceled, torn apart. Um, and so then comes in like the anxiety and the fear sort of overtaking you from, from being in, in, in action. And I know that you've shared publicly a bit about your, your journey with anxiety and depression. And I feel like it's becoming more of like a normalized conversation within our generation to like talk about, yeah, girl, this is what the therapist said this week. And like really speaking to that, um, but just with all the, the balls in the air that we have to, to juggle of self-talk and self sort of um, negative self-talk, uh, just dig in more because I'm feeling it in my spirit that is talking to people that like, how do I just get over that hump of all the things going on in my head? It's hard, you know, but the real thing is that you got to be objective with yourself. Mm -hmm. All the things that you're doing, you know, it's just, it's, it's so... <clears throat> First of all, part of it is what we've been through. You know what I mean? What, you know, the things that other people have told us, you know, the things that people have told us since very young to the point that those are the things that we then tell ourselves, the things we watch on television, what they tell us about who we are and who we, mm -hmm. or how we should relate to one another or to ourselves if we look like this or are this tall or this short or do this job or do this thing. You know, we're constantly overconsumed with people telling us in, in, in advertising and everything, telling us who we should be and how we should feel about ourselves. And so I think the first thing is to realize that my brain is like a computer. So half the stuff that's in here really, it ain't really even me. It's just stuff that I've seen and I've heard that I'm trying to process and now I'm owning it. Um, and, um, and and some of it is hurt, hurtful things that I can't let go of that I need to work through. And so I think once we come to terms with that, then maybe it's a little bit easier to be objective about which thoughts we want to buy into or not. Because mm -hmm. I, I think very young, I don't know why I had this quality, but very young, um, before I got older and you start getting inside of your own head, I mean, I would tell, I would, I would, a bad thought would come into my mind and I would say, that's not real. Like to myself, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it was like, oh, well, what if something happens? And I, I think to myself, that's not real. That's what I would say to myself. And then when I was about, you know, 17, 18, 19, it got, I, I just forgot about this, that ability. You know, right. I forgot that right. I used to say that to myself. And so I started to believe when I would say bad things to myself, you know, or hurtful things or, you know, anxiety triggering things. I would just start to go along with that storyline until I did some self work and, and, and put some practice in, into my life, like therapy, um, yoga, meditation, things like that, that allowed mm -hmm. me to come outside of myself and say, well, why would I say that to myself? You know, well, why, why, why is that? If I've got to, if I'm going to believe a narrative and it, and I don't know if it's true either which way, why would I choose, I choose, choose one the one? negative one? Why would I yeah. choose the one that makes me feel like bad about myself? You know, so I think yeah, it's learning to be objective and that whatever that you choose to believe is your outcome. And that's how we sometimes end up going around in this strange loop. I saw this incredible play called The Strange Loop. Um, so good. So good. So good. Wasn't it incredible? I've <laughs> seen it. Or, I wasn't know, ready for it. I wasn't ready, wasn't ready for it. For and it. I need it on video. video. <laughs> it's an incredible story about this black writer who's gay and he's telling himself all these terrible things about who he is and who he has to be mm -hmm. and what he has to amount to. And it just, the, without spilling the story to you, it's about what we're talking about, which is yep. we all get wrapped up in telling ourselves horrible narratives, horrible narratives. And all they are, are narratives. And we get to decide when we want to cut that strange loop, when we want to create a different story, the difference between, you know, oh, that person doesn't like me. And that person is too silly to see me for who I really am. They're not for me. It's the difference between how you choose to perceive a situation. And so 
again, we don't really know, you know, everything is subjective in life, essentially, you know what I mean? Except for the sky being blue. I think we all can agree about that. But mm -hmm. some things are, most things, you know, they're pretty subjective. And so if that's the case, then choose the thing that makes you feel the best. Right. It's real. It's that self realization of the power that you have. And to what yeah. you said, the objective, be objective about yourself. Woo, I like that. You know, All right. so you have been called you are the voice of of millennials and beyond. I'm saying I'm saying you're spanning generations. I have kids. They know about you. I'm still engaging with you. My mama knows about you. And so oh, the, <laughs> I mean, you talked about the, the family brand, um, but taking it back to specifically um, social media, right? Like you are very much entertaining and engaging with us from them talking about your baby, which I don't <laughs> like that, leave his name alone, <laughs> to, you know, posts coming out and like you're, uh, you know, saying, yeah, that was me, you know, standing on top of my head. Like you just play it so well. Um, how do you step into the fire of social media, yeah. the fire bucket that social media can be sometimes, and then step out and be Lauren? Yeah. And volley back and forth. Balance. It's a hard balance. And I think it's a hard balance for any of us, right? Because at the end yeah. of the day, social media is still a, pre a, a presentation to some degree. Yeah, mm -hmm. You're not getting on there mm -hmm. showing everything because that's crazy. You don't, you don't have to and you shouldn't. That's not, you know, that's not necessary. But because there is a level of presentation and sometimes your, you know, your social media can be related to your work or your career, it can end up becoming all encompassing if you're not too careful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I really did have to, at a certain point, really establish like with myself, what my boundaries were with what I'm going to do on my page, what I'm not going to do on my page and okay. um, you know, how I would regulate what, what is, Oh, what is what is for this space and what is not for this space? Okay. Uh, what do I identify as my I'm not entertaining time? And that was big for me because I've been entertaining for so long that it became kind of like, who am I? You're always I'm, on. Right. I'm like, who am I when I'm not entertaining? Uh, you know, it yeah. became very spooky. -ooky. I was just kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, and so it took time to really d develop my understanding of that and create a boundary that also is flexible because we change. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, I feel good about where I am with it, uh, you know, and I think it's it's different for everybody. Uh, it's just asking yourself those questions of, of what, what I'm okay with. Always checking in with yourself. And when things get weird, backing up off of it. Um, I think for the most part, I like social media, right? I like it. I like talking to my audience. I like talking to my fans. I like having the freedom of creating my own content. Um, that, that really is big, especially mm -hmm. coming from traditional. As a traditional talent, I mean, it was so difficult at a certain age to really get to really tell your story as an artist, to really create your own narrative and really say, this is the kind of talent that I am. You know, mm -hmm. this is the kind of thing that I can do or that I'm capable of. And social media allowed me to show a lot of different colors of myself. And so I think I have a soft spot always for that as a content creator, because it allowed me to, to evolve as an artist in a way that a lot of other spaces did not. Um, so I think that's also something to remember is that it's a tool. It's not a lifeline. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not a it's not a really a popularity contest. It doesn't have to be any of those things. But what it can be is a tool. And as long as we remember to make it work for us and not us working for it, then I think um, then we're usually on the right side of it. I love that. And clicking down into that even one step deeper. Right. When you when people become a content creator, there's also the the capitalistic part of it, right? Brands want to work with you. And I know that you've worked with some of the largest brands in the world. What are some of the, the tangible lessons that you've learned about navigating like brand goals and yeah. then maintaining like your creative authenticity and voice in what you put out? Well, this is the great thing about being a content creator is when people come to you, they're coming to you for that voice. Mm -hmm. um, they're coming to you because they know who it is you are and what it is you're going to bring to it, whatever it is. You know, and we see that all the time. We see so many different artists work with the same brands and have a totally different outcome in terms of what the content is that they produce together. Um, and I think for me, um, unless a brand is like absolutely not inclusive and just terrible, horrible people, I'm open to us 
seeing what could be done together. How can we collaborate? Because, hey, is these are these dollars going back into my community? You know, how can mm -hmm. we make it something that works for me? Because that is key, the Kiki Palmer brand. is It's got to be something positive it's, or it, it's got to be fun. It definitely can't hurt nobody. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's got to have, you know, you know, when you come to Kiki, it's going to be a little bit, oh, it can get, it can get edgy, but it's going to be wholesome with love. You know, we're going to have family involved. You know, there are certain things that I add uh, to let people know that this is who I am. This is what I'm about. And if we're going to do something together, then this is the level in which it has to be. And again, as a content creator, uh, that is the beauty. Because before I, I did any of that, before I had social media, before I was able to really establish the, the brand identity that I wanted for myself, Anybody would throw anything at me and say, hey, maybe this goes, you know, it would be nothing curated. But now, because I have developed over these years, this this brand that people, um, you know, know or have at least some smidgen of an idea about when a brand does come to me, they know how to come and they know how to come correct because mm -hmm. they know what I'm going to be standing for. And that, um, you know, what the perspective view needs to be in order for me to, to, to lend you my audience. And it's all about protection. I protect my audience. I know what I'm coming with. You know, uh -huh. I know, uh, you know, what my audience looks at, at me as and what they expect. And so I try to put that in thought into any partnership I do. And if something that I can't stand behind or something that I can't even like, if I'm not, if I don't feel proud of it, then I just don't do it. Um, and that can be difficult because sometimes people will pay you a lot of money. But I mean, I've been in situations where people want to pay me a lot of money. I said, this isn't going to work, y'all. Well, well that's what I'm wondering, right? Because yeah. the translation of what you're saying is like, own your brand, own your narrative, whether you have, um, you know, the the big platform that you have as a multi hyphenate entertainer, or whether you're in the corporate space and you're building your brand, right? If you're yeah. always the fix it person, then that's your narrative. But if you don't like it, then how do you get the narrative that you want to attract the things that you want? And don't be afraid right? Don't be afraid to come correct with folks. Because a lot of times I think, you know, it's almost like that Atlanta episode. I don't know if anybody had seen it or maybe you have seen it, but the, Atlanta, the goofy episode. Yes. I love that episode because I think black people, we carry that weight a lot to the point where we will be like that man in that video where <laughs> even though that was a satire, it's like, it does get to the point where you're like, am I doing enough for my community? Am I being a sellout? Is this going to yeah. be good? Is this going to be enough? Should I work with the corporations? Am I accountable? And it takes you over. It takes you over. Until you become goofy. <laughs> literally. And it's, I love that episode. And, and the reality is, you don't have to, uh, you know, um, struggle or not work with the big corps to prove mm -hmm. a point to somebody. That's bull. You don't have to do that. But what you can do is be conscious and intentional with your collaborations and think about what you can do with it as it pertains to your community and the things that are important to you. So mm -hmm. instead of being like, oh no, that's whack, that's lame, say, well, wait a minute. Would you guys be interested in doing it this way? Because mm -hmm. this is the only way that I can stand behind this. And personally, I feel like it's important to point out because this is, if you really want my me as a content creator, this is what my audience views you guys as. So mm -hmm. in order for me to do something with y'all, it needs to be something around here. Be real with them. And most times, if they're really good, you know what I mean? If these, these corporations that are smart, which I'll be honest, most corporations are, if they're coming to you, they want you to be real. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They're coming to you because they need your help. And so, again, it goes into knowing your brand, knowing the like value of it, and using it to help shape these relationships with right. these brands and also helping them to evolve because they do need you mm -hmm. um and so mm -hmm. i remember it, it and it's been that way for me even in, in acting you know i remember being called to do grease live and um it's mark platt who's an incredible uh producer he's done tons of great work still to this day um and but it was it was intimidating but i had to say it to him because they wanted me for the role of marty in grease live and i'm thinking to myself y'all is this uh, token type of situation, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. black and grease. You know what I mean? Like I'm not opposed to it, <laughs> but I need to know more. Say more. You know, why are you doing this? You know yeah, what does yeah. it mean to you? You know what I mean? And and, and it was nerve wracking to say it because this is like I said, a big producer, and I was only like 19 or something at the time. But I really felt like I don't want to be a joke in this. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to just be here to just be here because you guys are saying, you know 
y'all wanted a black person in Greece. Um, and we had a long conversation about it. And he, you know, you know, I told him this, what I'm saying to you. And he looked at me in my face and said, no, you do. I want you to do this because you're the only person that can do the part. I saw you on Broadway. You know, I saw you play Cinderella. And we want to add the Broadway elements of Marty's character that wasn't in Greece to this live showing that we're doing. And you are honestly the only person to do it. And if we're going to do Greece again, damn it, we do need to make it look like the world of kids today. So mm -hmm. that's the reality of why we want to do it. But do we just want to pop you in because you're black? No, we want to pop you in because, baby, this is Kiki Palmer. Right. And so once I heard that, then I was like, now we're on the same page. And as long as you know, mm -hmm. now we're good. You know what I mean? And it's, it's about respect. So again, when you have these conversations with these brands, producers, directors, whoever it is in your field, if they don't care for your opinion at all, and they're coming to you and asking you to do something they're paying you for, if they don't even respect you to 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 move or to, you know to just see what they can work, or, you know, then this is probably not worth it anyway. But I, I would I would uh, my bet would be that they would be interested. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is like self advocacy and having a tough conversation, and also a curious mindset. Are you hiring me because I'm the token black? Oh, no. OK, great. Then let's kind of talk it through. You know, I know like now we good and we could, you know, and be real with them. together. You know I mean, I, I mean I, I'm a humorous person, so I'm always like, because let's be real. You know, mm -hmm. I, I always bring it to the table of like, because, honey, we can't be looking crazy out there because they're going to be looking crazy at you, too. You know, <laughs> put it back on folks. You know what I mean? Where it's right, like, right. I'm not just looking out for me. I'm looking out for you. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because it's true. You know what I mean? It's not just you that they look at. You know, they look at everybody involved. Uh, whenever we see a scandal go down, they're looking at the corporation and the talent. So mm -hmm. it's like we both going to be in shambles if we don't get it right. So yeah. that's also a way that you can have that conversation and break that ice and, and, and make it human. I think what you just shared is, is the secret, but not such a secret. It's just things that we know but we have to be open to receiving it so that we can act different, more, better in, in the spaces that we want to be in. But, you know, you shared the secret of not only staying present, but staying relevant in this space where it's like fast fashion, fast entertainment, all these things. And you've proven longevity. You know, the other day I was talking to my husband. He's like, did you know that um, Samuel L. Jackson, like, his like first movie or something was like, he was like at 43 or something like that. And you're only, I don't need to say your age, but you're a grown woman, but you have so much more to go in. Well, in well, what you've I turned 55 this year. <laughs> <laughs> like don't be cracking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I love thinking about Sam. His story is amazing. Yes. Yes. Um, and so I wonder, you know, with so many years uh, uh, ahead of you, how are you are you are you worrying about continuing that longevity or are you just in the present of like as opportunities as you're called um, mm -hmm. spiritually to do a thing? If that's what's guiding you, just talk me through how you think of like yeah. playing long term. So I wouldn't say that I'm worried, but I definitely think about it. I think about it all the time because I'm curious. Um you know, I have ideas, right? But I've learned over the course of my journey to, to manifest the feelings of what I want more so than manifesting what exactly it needs to look, la look like. Mm -hmm. I really do also want to be surprised. And I know that God has a better plan for me than I have for myself. So I don't want to be like, I want a house with three rooms and really I'm about to get a house with a million. You know what I'm saying? Um, even don't though that limit yourself. Don't limit myself. Even though those aren't my dreams, my dreams are more like, I want to be happy. I want to have something to hand over. I want to be able to leave, leave my family with something. I want to build something that's bigger than myself. You know, these are the things that I talk, talk to myself about. You know, I mention, or I say, you know, I love, I say aloud to myself, I'm so proud of what Tyler Perry has been able to accomplish or what Oprah Winfrey has accomplished. You know, these are things that I could, you know, in my dreams, you know, I speak these things. Um, mm -hmm. So it, more so for me, I think it's about, uh, you know, I, I want to stay open. I stay on the trajectory, stay present with what I'm doing today. And I actively try these different things that align with what I feel my future would look like. Um, and I do think I use different examples of people that as I create my blueprint to, to you know, be inspired from. You know, I look at what Tyler did. He's a huge inspiration for me. He created a, an amazing character and a, a whole franchise and IP that, you know, no one saw coming and then stepped outside of that and then created a brand outside of himself that started careers for others. Um, so much so that he, he gave 
um, so many jobs, you know, yep. to the city of Atlanta, you know, to the point where he ended up having his own studio, something that no one's done. I mean, outside of Walt Disney, really, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and he was also the same man that was living out of his car at one time, um, you know, and he's philanthropic. He constantly is doing humanitarian works, you know, it's just it's incredible. And so I look at that and I tell myself, OK, well, how can I shift? OK, well, let me pull myself back. What is it like to direct? You know, what is it like to write? What is it like to produce? What is it like to support? What is it like to be in the background? How do I what, what I want to try these different positions out? And so I think that that's how I think about my future is, you know, trying different things, putting it out there, what I would like for myself, not being too hell bent on what it needs to look like, staying present and allow myself to enjoy it moment by moment, mm -hmm. but being open to what to whatever could change and what the future could hold. But I'm excited nonetheless, because I know that it's going to be something that I am proud of. I love that. The curiosity mindset. What if, what does that look like? Let me try that on and see if that's, you know, another thing that I could um, have an achievement with or master or build competency in. And they, all those dots connect. They I'm do. Talking, I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to me in my head too. <laughs> no, they do. Cause it's so funny, but when you they sit connect. back and write You'll think about somebody that you met years ago that you did one little thing with, and then five years later you end up doing something like this, and then all of a sudden y'all come back together and y'all want to make a your life. And you're like, kismet. oh my gosh. Kismet. Kismet. Oh, yes, kismet. yes. I love that. I have whenever I have those moments, it just inspires and motivates me to like, like you said, stay open. Stay open. You to. Real talk. Um, because those are the things that remain sticky as you go on your journey to be able to come back to different relationships or just acquaintances or things that can serve with whatever your higher um, purpose goal and all of that and all of that. Yeah. All right. So I've got some rapid fire, but like, I don't want just like one word. You could like give me a little, a little context to, okay. to, to the questions. All right. So, so the PJ, the jet's about to pull up. Where's the pilot taking you? Mm, jet's about to pull up. Where's the pilot taking me? Ooh, somewhere, somewhere to relax, child. I don't know, care where <laughs> it is. I'm going somewhere to relax, somewhere where the people can't find me. Okay. Okay. Isolation. I like yeah. that. Girls trip. What's on the agenda? Honey, we're going down to Nola, baby. We walk in the streets of Bourbon. And okay. we're going to be in the French Quarter having some um, beignets. Then we're going to be going down to one of those rinky-dink places they be dancing at that's just chill and not about anything other than having fun. We're going to get us a grenade or whatever they call the drink and just yep, have a ball. Yep. <laughs> I love it. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. One social app has to go on your phone. Who's getting the axe first? Oh, one social app has to go. You know what? Oh, it's so hard for me. Okay. You know what? <laughs> I don't know if this is a social app. Oh man. You know, it's, 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 it's okay. So it's between, this is going to be bad because these are, these are popular ones, TikTok mm -hmm. and Twitter. Mm -hmm. I like them both a lot, but I'm just, on, I'm on them the least. I can't let go of Instagram. Right. And honestly, right. All my, all my family is on Facebook. You know, that's what the cousins and the grandma. <laughs> exactly. Are. That's how you keep in touch with the fam. I can't get rid of them. So it's a toss up between Twitter and TikTok. Sometimes TikTok, it just makes me feel just too crazy when I go there. But mm -hmm. it is funny. All right. Uh, meeting up with a past co-star for dinner. Who is it? Oh, that's so hard. Doesn't mean your favorite. Just like in this moment where you okay, are. Meeting up with a past co-star. You know what? I'll say Vanessa Hudgens. Okay. I love Vanessa Hudgens. She's so much fun. We did Grease together. And I, had seen, I haven't seen her in a long time. And me and her have just been talking. She's getting ready to get married. I just had a baby. We're just, you know, it's so funny. Time goes by. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Time goes by. And when you check back in with folks, it's just like, wow. Where has the time taken us? You know, I was looking at a photo that somebody had posted on online. <clears throat> and it was of me and all these girls that I did this show. I did a show called Scream Queens with. Yep. And they were like, all, you know, they were like, we feel old. All the girls from Scream Queens are pregnant or they have kids. And I'm like, literally, we were literally like, I would have never been back then. I'm like, I, I was thinking, what would it be like when I have a family of my own? You know what I mean? And it's so funny because <laughs> and myself that, yeah. and all of them are, are now at that stage in our lives. And and so, yes, yeah, so I would love to see Vanessa just because 
we were at different stages, you know, and I've known her since I was, since I started acting. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's fun to, to go back there. Okay. Your favorite meme in general, but also favorite meme of yourself. Okay, the favorite meme of myself, it can change because the things that the folks do online, they make it so good. They really give me life, love. I can get so much life from them. Um, so I'll say the one that I love now is, mm, this one has a little sweetness to it because they keep on, you know, the other day I seen somebody put that same meme and they said, when a mosquito takes a bite out of a diabetic, mm, this one has a little sweetness to it. I'm like, why would you guys do this? Right, right. So, Who's sitting there and thinking of these things and then creating it? The internet is undefeated. Do you understand? It's undefeated. And then my favorite meme, I think it's um, you know, it's so funny because it can go with anything. Um, and I I first seen this meme because it was like a a video online of this guy taking, you know, uh, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? A competition, kind of like a dare of Mm -hmm. doing all these shots back to back to back to back to back. And the video was like crazy because it was like dude, you shouldn't be taking these many shots. Right. And then, you know, you'll look at the comments of what people say, and they're like, his liver was like, I don't have the capacity. And it was this, <laughs> man, it's this video of this, this older black man. He's like on a, he's like on a, a stage like this. And he's like, I don't have the capacity. <laughs> and so now I use it for anything. Anytime I'm, you know, baby was just born and me and my partner are in the bed, the baby crying, we looking at each other. He looks over at me. He's Neither like, one of y'all had it. So that's one of my favorite ones, too. My favorite one of yours is Sorry to This Man. Ah, uh, you know, that I, I need, need you to tell me the backstory of why you pre- that whole dialogue had my whole group chat in a chokehold for, for months. Tell us a little backstory about that, please. I never, I never would have imagined for that video and that answer to, I mean, that I might as well have had a hit movie in theaters. That's like Hello. how huge that <laughs> meme went to the point of no return. And I honestly, I was being, you know, this is the thing when you're getting interviewed and, and I guess maybe this is a part of my personality. I, I, I take, even though I don't take myself too seriously, I take everything I do serious. Meaning mm-hmm. I try to give a hundred percent of myself. If I'm saying I'm coming, you're going to get a hundred percent. I would never show up somewhere 20%. So mm-hmm. I think that's probably mm-hmm. half of it is that I, I was so serious. Like I was so like, right. like this is a lie detector test. I'm here. Truth time. <laughs> exactly. I think that's probably what made people maybe laugh a little bit too. But then also like, I genuinely didn't want to be rude. Like I genuinely didn't want to be rude. And I didn't want to be silly, but they was asking me to give an opinion <laughs> of this man. And I didn't and like, I can't, I want to give you an honest one. And I don't know the man. So I can't even like, I mean. Why well, you have to say sorry to him like that though? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I I love that answer. You were like, this this is me. This is how I feel about this. I love it. Okay, my last question, because we're at time already. Um, values. When you think of the uh, one value that you've learned throughout your career, I know there's many what would you like to impart on us, on the audience of a value that we should carry with us moving forward for 2023? What's the word for 2023? No, do not expect anything. And what I mean by that is like, and this is a good thing, right? It's going to sound not cold, but it's going to sound sterile maybe, but it's like, no one cares. So don't expect anything because it does you a disservice uh, to, to, to expect or to look for, or to, you know, want validation from, you know, it's a waste of your time because all it does is really take you away from the goal of what you're trying to really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go where the love is period. You know, don't look for it elsewhere or wonder when it's going to finally come there someday because it might not ever. And honestly, who cares? Not you, you know, so I would say don't expect anything. Don't expect anything from anybody. Just be appreciative of the love that's there. Live in a space of gratitude and you appreciate what it is you do. Let that number one mm-hmm. be the most meaningful because what, what I've learned and what I've seen a lot is we can get really wrapped up in somebody else saying we did a good job. Or somebody else saying, you belong on this stage. 
Yeah. Come on up. And we could have had, we could have been doing, yeah, we could have been doing great for two, for 30 years, but it don't mean nothing till we walk up on that stage. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not real. What's real is the love that you gave and the love you received, the real moments that you created doing what it is you're doing. That's really what life is about. Um, and, and, and so I would say, don't expect anything. You know, you can appreciate what comes. But don't expect anything. Be on your your thing. Do your thing and be proud of what you're doing for what, you know, who you're doing it for. And leave it at that. You know what I mean? And enjoy life, you know. And that, y'all, is the key to freedom. And so on that note, I want to thank you so much for being here. We have been blessed. You were the blessing to us as we close out uh, Black History Month and Onward, you've given us stuff to last a lifetime. And so I thank you for being so giving of your time uh, and choosing us in this moment as you're embarking on your new chapter as a parent. We are so appreciate this hour that you've spent with us. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure has been all mine. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.